welcome back. So glad that you can join us. Today we're concluding a three-part series or a three-week series that we've been speaking about on kingdom economics. We've been looking at having a biblical response to how a believer should navigate this financial crisis that we keep hearing about on the news. You know, you turn on the news and you hear financial crisis, economy, inflation, and all this stuff can produce a fear in your heart if you're not living in the truth of God's word. And the word of God shouldn't just bring faith and comfort to us in times that are unusual, but also instruction and wisdom. So if you're only joining us today and you missed part one and two, the good news is that you can go back and watch part one and two where we spoke about good stewardship and then last week on tithing on our Facebook or YouTube platforms. But we're really glad that you could join us for this section today. We looked last week at the subject of tithing, big subject, but we, made, we managed to squeeze it in to our session together last week, looking at why we tithe and how we tithe correctly. Two very good questions, why we tithe, the why behind the what, and how we're to tithe correctly. Again, looking at it from a biblical perspective. Now, the third aspect of kingdom economics, which is the subject matter of this three-week series, is we need to look at giving. More specifically, having a lifestyle of deliberately sowing and reaping. Maybe you've heard that terminology before, that we to sow and reap. But do you understand it? Do you know what the Bible teaches us concerning being a, a person that's got a lifestyle, not a moment, a lifestyle of sowing and reaping and the benefits of such a lifestyle? It's about having a lifestyle, a way of living, of sowing and reaping, and how that has a direct relationship with the previous section from last week called tithing. You see, when we teach on tithing, it's related to the subject of sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping is related to the subject of tithing. Because sowing and reaping is now putting seeds in the prepared ground that tithing has now correctly provided for you. So we were teaching last week that when a person tithes, they're walking in obedience and honour, returning to the Lord what belongs to the Lord. But in doing so, it opens the windows of heaven above their life. But also, it prepares the ground of their life for them to now be able to sow and reap effectively. Now, I love this concept. I love this, um, this way of thinking. And one of the best ways of understanding this very simple yet profound way of living is to think about the life of an effective farmer. Not an uneffective one, but an effective farmer. How does an effective farmer live? Well, we can look at the natural world of agriculture and farming to teach us what we need to know about how to sow and reap correctly, but also the expectations of correct sowing and reaping. So let's look at a couple of things that a successful farmer will do. Number one, a farmer will prepare the soil. There's probably a lot more things that I'm missing out, but these are the highlight thoughts I want you to consider today as we talk about sowing and reaping and comparing a farmer to what we should be in the life that God has given us. Firstly, the farmer prepares the soil. You don't see a farmer go out with his quality seed and just chuck it everywhere in, in soil that's filled with weeds or not been ploughed or not been dug over, not been prepared. In the same way, as a farmer, when we tithe, we prepare the soil for the seed that we're going to sow. And then we see a farmer get his seed, his quality seed, he sows his seed into the soil, believing in the potential of the soil. In some ways he's testing the soil. Remember what the Lord said to us last week with the tithe, test me in this. There's no assurance, there's just experience and confidence that good soil and good seed produce good harvest. Next, the farmer waits for the soil to do what it does. You don't see the farmer sow his seed and come back three minutes later. He knows that the soil needs to now do what it needs to do with the seed to produce the harvest. That's his expectation. And then what does the farmer do? This is a good bit. He harvests the crop. Where did the crop come from? The seed that he sowed in the good soil. The harvest didn't appear by itself. It's the result of seed sown in prepared soil. And then what does the farmer do? The farmer, if he's a wise farmer, 
will take the best of the crop and sow it again for ongoing provision because not to do that would leave him in momentary success. Imagine if a farmer sowed once at the harvest, didn't hold any seed back, he'd have a wonderful one-time experience, but actually the next year, the following years, would be affected by his foolishness. That's why when we sow and reap, it's not something we do once in our life. It's an ongoing way of living, like a farmer has an ongoing way of living with crops and harvests. That's what God wants us to experience, especially in our finances, even in a time when other people are saying financial crisis. Now, where does it start? It starts with us, I believe, very simply separating the tithe and the seed. Because when I speak to some Christians today, they've never separated the tithe and the seed. They haven't seen them as two separate things. And in not seeing them as two separate things, they miss out on a system, a kingdom way of doing economy that's very important. Now, two different or separate components, tithe and seed, working together in unison in God's plan of caring for us and prospering us. So both have a key part to play. The tithe, like we studied last week, is the tenth. The tenth part, the first part, the first tenth, the first fruit of all of our increase. The seed is, is that or whatever we give beyond the tithe. Sometimes you say to people, are you tithing? And they tell you, yeah, we're giving here, we're giving there, we're giving to this work, we're giving to this evangelist. No, no, you don't tithe to those things. You tithe to your storehouse according to the instruction of God's word. But then whatever you give above your tithe, above the 10% that belongs to the Lord that you've returned to him, you are free to sow that wherever you would like. Now, unlike the tithe which belongs in the storehouse, this finance above the 10%, anything above the 10%, can go wherever you feel led or your heart is touched. Can I give you some good examples of good soil that I've used in my life? Uh, giving to alms would be a place. I'm not talking about alms, I'm talking about alms needs, humanitarian care. Giving seed into things of people's practical needs is always very, very good soil. What am I talking about? Widows, orphans, humanitarian needs. God speaks to us over and over again about taking care of the poor. Those who give to the poor lend to God. Here's some, if you're taking some notes, Psalms 41 verses 1 to 3. Proverbs 21 verses 13 and 19 and 17. Leviticus 25, 35 to 37. Galatians 6 to 2. All of these verses and many more speak of how God would have us to take care of the poor. Now the church takes care of the poor through the resources of being a storehouse. But e equally, individuals like you and me should constantly be letting the Holy Spirit prompt our hearts and stir our hearts regarding taking finance above the 10% that we've returned to the storehouse, which has prepared the soil, and give that into um, humanitarian stuff where people's lives are in need. Also, another good thing to give to with your seed, not your tithe, your seed, is missions and missionaries. What God is doing around the world through different people's lives. You know, I support a number of people that are doing missions work, but I don't give them a percentage of my tithe. I'm going to keep underlining that. I give my tithe to the storehouse, but then above my tithe, I sow seed into missionaries, I sow seed into humanitarian care, orphans, widows, taking care of what God loves. I sow seed into other ministries, uh, which could include evangelists and church planters. Again, this has been terrible sometimes, even with Christian media, where you've had evangelists and other ministries saying, send us your tithe. You should never send your tithe to um, an itinerant ministry, you should send seed. I'm not saying don't send anything, I'm saying you send your tithe, you return your tithe to the storehouse, but then you can give seed to missionaries, to widows, to orphans. You can sow wherever you like as the Lord leads your heart, including to uh, uh, ministries that are evangelistic and other aspects of ministry. Um, also, another one that I've not really got Bible verses for, but I've always done in my life and it's worked, is I always sow up or sow where I want to go. Sometimes my tithe is in the presence of the Lord, 
but my seed, I look at someone that's successful in an area of their life and I'm like, Lord, I want to step into a greater dimension of that grace. And again, what I've learned to do over the years is to sow up and sow into things that are successful. And I've always seen a return because sometimes your seed needs to go down to take care of other people. Sometimes your seed needs to go up to cause you to have a stepping stone and a healthy field into the next that God has got for you. All of these things we could take a lot longer to teach on. But when this is done effectively, the tithe is returned to the Lord and the seed is sown from our life. We actually empower the church and the resources of the church to be able to respond like it needs to respond, as well as having harvests going on in our world that are a responsibility of what we've chosen to sow in outside of our tithe. I hope that makes sense. Now, it's benefiting from a principle. Again, some may call it a law, I call it a principle that's called seed time and harvest. Now, this is something that God designed and instituted to benefit us, not to harm us. But remember, whatever a person sows, they're going to reap. So if you want to use the principle um, of sowing and reaping to get bad stuff and bad harvests in your life, more for you, but you can do that. Or you can do what God intended and use the principle of seed time and harvest, the law of seed time and harvest, to, to be something where you deliberately sow good seed and benefit from good harvests, it's your choice. You know, if you, if you sow gossip, you're gonna get gossip. If you sow bitterness, you're gonna get bitterness. Whatever you sow, you're gonna reap, okay? But if you sow love, you'll get love. If you sow stuff, you get stuff. The principle works um, however you wanna to choose to facilitate its, its potential. Now, another principle I believe, um, it's another principle that carries beyond the cross, like the law of gravity. When we say the law of sowing and reaping, we're not talking about the mosaic law, we're talking about People speak of the law of gravity, what goes up must come down. In that context, it's a law of sowing and reaping, that what you sow, you will reap. It's a law, you can try and deny it. Um, if you try and deny gravity, you'll get hurt. If you try and deny seed time and harvest, you'll live in a lower standard or a lack that God never intended for you. It's something that God initiated for our benefit, not our harm. It was something that he initiated to cause us to be fruitful and multiply. Now again, different people have different stands on prosperity, but you've got to understand in the original design of man, God made him and positioned him and equipped him and set him up to be fruitful and multiply. Not to be greedy, not to be a hoarder, but to be fruitful and multiply. You can read about this um, in Adam and Eve, Genesis 1, 28, if you're making notes says that God made them and positioned and said to them, now be fruitful and multiply. You read about the journey of Noah, and you can read in Genesis 9, uh, verse 1 and verse 7, that God speaks to Noah and says, right, I've positioned you now. I've straightened some things out. I've positioned you. Now my desire for you is that which I had for Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Now, these are great words, Hebrew words, uh, fruitful and multiply. The Hebrew word for fruitful is para, and it means bear fruit, be fruitful, bring forth, increase. So what God was saying to man in original design was I've designed for you to be fruitful, to bear fruit, to bring forth an increase, not just with having babies, but in managing life. So what about multiply? The word multiply is the word rabba, the Hebrew word rabba, and it means to increase, excel, enlarge, and be full. God's desire for man and man's experience of provision is represented in both this thing that he spoke to um, Adam, but also to Noah. So God instituted this law, like gravity, that was both natural and spiritual to enable what we call sowing and reaping. The tithe prepares the ground for our seed wherever we choose to sow it. But then when we take seed, which is an amount above the 10% or the 10th, we then are sowing to reap a harvest. Now, it's a law that affects every area of our life. Like I said, you can see it working in friendship. Proverbs 18.24 says, if you want friends, be friendly. What you sow, you reap. Uh, Proverbs 11.25, um, those who refresh others will be refreshed themselves. On and on and on and on. Wherever you turn in the Bible and in the world, you'll see that what a person sows, that they will reap. It's a continual principle, not an Old Testament one. 
I want to give you some other verses because we're studying the word today concerning this subject. Genesis 8.22 says, While the earth remains, seed time harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. This is something that God said to Noah. Listen to what he said. As long as the earth remains, is the earth still there? Then the principle still remains. Seed time and harvest, the first one on the list, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will not cease. Do we still have summer and winter? Do we still have day and night? Do we still have hot and cold? Yes, we do. They are principles that God set in motion like gravity, but sowing and reaping was at the top of the list. We need to be going, hey, I'm going to get excited about my sowing because it's a continued principle, not something that was an experience of a few in an old covenant. Let's turn to the book of Galatians, chapter 6 and verse 7. Do not be deceived. Don't rip your head off. Don't rip yourself off. God is not mocked for whatever one sows that he will reap. Let's look at what was taught in Luke 6. This is the words of Jesus. Luke 6 in verse 38. Give and it will be given to you. Give, sow, and it will come back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. With the measure you choose to use, it will be measured back to you. So if you want a small harvest, sow a small seed. That's not about amount, it's about percentage and effect on your heart. You want a large harvest, sow it hard. God's saying, hey, I didn't just give this principle to a farmer to govern the success of crops. I'm giving this principle to every one of my followers and everyone that wants to live by them. Do you know that there's people that are unsaved that live by the principle of sowing and reaping are more effective than some Christians? Look at some businessmen that live off of 10% of their income because they're so wealthy and put 90% back into humanitarian care and they keep on resourcing finance. Think about it. They're operating in a principle designed by God for us. When we've got Christians that go, I don't believe that sowing and reaping stuff. You better. That's like saying you don't believe in gravity. Gravity will win. All right. Now, seed is what you release from your life intentionally to multiply so we should be living lives that are returning the tithe to the lord but also releasing seed for our today and our tomorrow because we understand the principles of god for navigating any financial crisis so much we could teach i'm just taking highlight truths and thoughts here we need to understand the principle of seed kind but every seed bears fruit after its own kind. So when we look at our life and we see a deficit, the best thing that we can do is sow into that. Again, using an example of encouragement. Sometimes I've had Christians say to me, no one ever encourages me. No one ever encourages me. I just want to be encouraged. My first question to them, being an honest man, is when's the last time you encouraged someone? Because the Bible says, what you sow, you will reap. And often they look at me and go, well, it's not about them, it's about me. There's your problem. If you start to sow encouragement, encouragement will come back to you because seed has seed kind. If there's a need in your life, look for the seed that can change the harvest reality. These are principles I've lived by. I don't just believe them, they work. So looking at a verse in Genesis 1, verse 11, 111. Again, we see this principle in original design. <clears throat> then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And, in, and so it was, the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kind and trees bearing fruit with seed in according to their kind. And God said it was good. God made things to contain seed so that the seed within the thing could secure a harvest of its permanence in its future. Worst thing we can do is eat our seed. Then you'll be like the farmer that has one crop. But equally, every seed bears fruit after its own kind. How can we put this simply? Carrots make carrots, cabbages make cabbages. What you sow, you reap. And in doing this, God puts the control of harvest back into your hands now what the lord was doing here in his intention was i believe giving a replacement structure of financial provision that was beyond us continually just being carried by him often when you look at the wilderness moments we've called it in the past manner life 
People couldn't sow and reap. reap. They were living on the dependence of God's goodness and provision in that season they were coming through. We always do that to some degree. But equally, God came up with a principle so that the sparrow wouldn't be always depending on its mother, but it would be able to fend for itself and secure for itself future outside of the dependency of a parent. That principle is sowing and reaping. Now, we need to make this, all right, our lifestyle and not a moment. We need to be continually believing God for seed, understanding the difference between seed and bread, sowing our seed, believing for harvests. One of my all-time favorite um, passages of scripture would obviously be 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 12. If you've got your Bibles with you, please turn your Bibles to this because it's so powerful uh, concerning understanding sowing and reaping. If not, make a note in your notes of that verse and go back and study it later. All right, let me read this to you. It's a large passage of scripture, but listen carefully. Remember this, be mindful of this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Again, measurement determined by you. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Attitude determines altitude. And God is able to bless you abundantly. Don't question his ability. So that in all things at all times, not sometimes and some things, in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts, their seed to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he, this, I love this. Now he who supplies or gives seed to the one who sows and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be, not might be, enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, giving like you want to, not just like you can. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform, sowing and reaping, is not only supplying for the needs of God's people, but it's also flowing over in many expressions of thanks to God. What an incredible passage of scripture. Six key points if you're making notes. You determine the amount and the heart you have behind it when you're giving. Two, giving should be a heart conviction, never a manipulation. You shouldn't tithe or give your seed or sow and reap because you're manipulated. You need to do it from a joyful heart that's convinced and convicted. Number three, God is able to respond in abundance. Don't doubt his ability or his abundance. Number four, God supplies seed to the one who intends to sow and desires to increase the size of that, pers the size of that person's seed barn. So God isn't mocked. All right, that's what it says. What a man sows, he will reap. If somebody's sitting there going, oh, give me seed, Lord, I'm going to sow. But they've got no intention of sowing. God isn't mocked. He knows the agenda of a person's heart. But when you have a person that says, all right, Lord, I get this. Give me seed to sow. He will provide you bread to eat. That's the provision for you and your house. But then he'll also bring finance or stuff into your life which is seed. You will know it's seed. You'll know it's not bread. You'll know it's God giving you what you asked. You then take that seed and sow it. So you have bread for you today and seed in the ground for you tomorrow. So it's a way of life. It's a way of living. Again, enrichment returns in every way. God, as well as it being kind, that produces in its kind, it brings blessing on other areas of your life like your tithe does. Point six is important. Your obedience to generosity into blessing others results in other people praising God because of what you've done. We should never give to get the praises for ourselves or the glory for ourselves, but we should give in such a way, Jesus taught, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. But when we're generous to others, suddenly we overhear them praising God for his provision. And we know because we didn't have clenched hands but open hands that we were being stewards but God used us to put resource in their life and now they're able to glorify God. I love that. Okay, I hope you're still with me and taking notes. Remember, there are three stages to seed time and harvest, not two. 
people go, oh, seed time and harvest. No, seed, time and harvest. When we understand this, we understand that faith has a part to play in us sowing, that we put our seed in the ground like a farmer and then an element of time goes by just like it does for a farmer when the seed is in the ground and then the harvest comes. Don't walk away from your harvest because you don't understand timings. Understand, you need to provide the seed into the ground, then allow the time to happen, and then the harvest will come. Seed, time, harvest. Hope you enjoyed that thought. I always love that thought. Also, here's a key one that's important, especially when we speak about navigating our lives through a time where people are talking about financial crisis, that sowing and reaping, living by God's law of sowing and reaping, is not subject to natural conditions. That sowing and reaping, doing it with godly revelation, will work when there's prosperity in the land, but also when there's famine in the land. You say, well, I'm not sure about that. Then you need to read Genesis chapter 26, verses 1, and then verses 12 to 14. Genesis, 1, uh, Genesis 26, verse 1, introduces this to Isaac and says, number one, and there was a famine in the land, a financial crisis in the land, apart from the one that was there from before. So Isaac is in a time where there's a double financial famine in the land, all right, a financial crisis. But then it says in verse 12, and Isaac sowed in that land and prospered, continued prospering and became very prosperous in that land so that the Philistines envied him and came up plans to try and stop his prosperity. Whoa, wait a moment. Isaac sowed in a land where everybody else was holding their seed back. Why? He was living by kingdom economy and kingdom principles. He says it doesn't matter if there's dust on the ground. God's principles still work. Sometimes when people hear financial crisis, they actually lock their seed away when actually that's a time to be sowing more passionately than ever before. Because the principle of seed time and harvest is not affected by natural climate or natural conditions. Someone needs to hear that. Um, we've got to constantly be sowing. So here, I've got a number of direct debits that go out of my life that sow into different ministries, missionaries. Other times I'm constantly walking around with seed in my pocket that the Lord's given me. Who shall I bless? Who shall I bless? But sometimes people give to one person. I'm like, no, let me get as much seed out there as I can. Now, Ecclesiastes encourages us to do that. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 says, cast your seed upon the sea. After many days, you may receive a return. Invest in seven ventures, yes, in eight. Give to seven places, give them to, to eight. You do not know what disaster may come upon your land, financial crisis. So what he's saying is be casting your seed to different places, be constantly flowing, because you don't know what disaster is coming upon the land, but you'll be ready for it when it does. And then it says this interesting parable type statement. If the clouds are full of water, they pour with rain, whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, where it falls, it lies. It's saying some things are no-brainers, all right? Verse 4, whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever considers natural conditions will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds equally will never reap. Don't allow things that are happening naturally around you, things you're hearing from the media and from modern economists, stop to stop you, number one, tithing, but also sowing. In fact, if they're saying there's less, we need to be like Isaac and be sowing more. Important stuff there. Be somebody that's constantly sowing seed in the ground. All right, generosity is a kingdom trait. Meanness isn't a kingdom trait. Generosity is a kingdom trait. Proverbs 28, 22, a stingy man um, lives in a decreasing world, a generous man, an opening world. Proverbs 11, 24 to 25, the one who gives increases all the more. Proverbs 22, verse 9, encourages us to have a bountiful eye. Isaiah 32, verse 8, says a generous man devises generous things, and by his generosity, he will stand. These are just a, a few verses that say, 
we're a kingdom people that mean we're a generous kingdom people. It's not about the amount we sow or give, it's about the percentage and the, acti and the activity of our heart as we do. We also need to understand that there's a relationship between us, our money, earth and heaven. The, like Russell Crowe said so well in the film, the, Gradia uh, the, the Gradiator, the Gladiator, what a man does in life echoes in eternity. There's a result in heaven, rewards in heaven for the things you do with what God entrusted you with here on earth. Now, you can lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. It says Matthew 6, verses 19 to 21, that things that we do with sowing and reaping here can affect things that we experience one day there. Lazarus and the rich man in Luke 16 verses 19 to 31 are examples of a man having something here and nothing there, while a person who had nothing here suddenly works into an inheritance there. There's a relationship between how we steward things on earth and what we'll experience in the life to come. And again, um, many verses that continue with that but I want to begin to bring us into a close that the Bible clearly teaches us about how we should handle our finances in a kingdom way but God leaves the choice always with us now whether we give the tithe to the Lord and see him open the windows of heaven isn't about has he as he promised it it's about will we dare to test him or us bringing offerings and giving offerings from persuasion or obedience and faith god leaves that choice with us so what choices do we have as we approach what economists are saying could potentially be a very serious financial crisis well, we shouldn't approach these coming days or months with fear or unbelief, greed or any other negative response. Rather, we should say, OK, I'm going to live a kingdom way of living. Over the last three weeks, Pastor Andy has taught about verses, many verses in the scripture concerning being a steward and not somebody that thinks he owns what he has about the power of the tithe leaving my life and being returned to the Lord, about the power of sowing and reaping, not as a one-off activity or moment, but something that's an ongoing in my life that secures plenty and abundance for me and for others in my days ahead. But sowing and reaping isn't dependent upon what the world or the media say I can experience but rather on what God promised I would experience if I lived faithful to his kingdom ways. So, how as believers should we handle our finances during a season called financial crisis or famine? Very simply, I'm going to answer that or summarise that with three statements. Number one, we see ourselves as stewards of what he has entrusted us to handle for him. Number two, we honour him with the tithe and always live to return the first or the first fruit to him. And number three, we purpose to live a lifestyle or ongoing way of living that involves sowing and reaping, sowing the seed, enjoying harvests and then sowing again. I hope that this has excited your heart. It has mine. Recently, the Lord spoke to me again about getting a fresh understanding of sowing and reaping. I believe he was speaking to me about that because of the forecast of what the world says is coming. Yet I clearly heard the Lord say to me, Andy, get excited. Don't just sow and reap. Get excited about sowing and reaping. Begin to write down in your journal when you sow a seed and when the harvest comes. And as I've been consciously doing that more over the last few weeks, I've suddenly noticed in a fresh way the way that when I sow seed, allow time, there is a harvest that comes. And when I take that harvest and I sow again, it just keeps on happening. But why should I be surprised if a farmer's not? Because farming is a way of life given to a person 
to secure their future and enjoy constant provision. Sowing and reaping has been given to us to give us a stability in the resources of our life where we're not dependent on councils or services to bail us out, but we see the Lord as the provider actually operating through the creating and giving of harvests in our world so that we experience the provision we need, but also our open hand to others can assist others who are struggling in difficult times also. I hope this last three weeks has been a benefit. Please, can I encourage you, if you've missed any of the weeks, go back and listen to week one, week two. But also, maybe you want to go back and re-listen. Look at the verses, study them again, because this really is an important subject for the moment that we're living in. The Lord bless you. Have a prosperous week, a week of sowing and reaping, a week of harvests. God bless.